Chase Elliott will be racing in the SRX season finale at Sharon Speedway. And the Miami GP and Dawn TV ratings have come out, and they are very, very similar TV ratings. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We've got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into those really, really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start our paint schemes and sponsorship news first. Let's jump into those really, really quickly. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Eric Amrol's 2022 Renegade Insurance Scheme that we're going to see later this year at Darlington Speedway and also will be an associate sponsor for Eric Amrol throughout the 2022 season. Really cool to see that Eric Amrol has a new sponsor that isn't Smithfield Foods. I love the Smithfield schemes, don't get me wrong. But it's great to see that Eric Amrol has another partner that's going to be willing to work with them. And I think the paint scheme looks really, really good in my opinion. And I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Darlington Raceway. I think it looks really, really awesome, to be honest with you. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Timmy Hill's 2022 Capulous Hair Club scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. Really awesome to see the Hair Club is sponsored Timmy Hill this weekend. It's also awesome great to see that Timmy Hill also have more sponsors that are willing to work with him. I think that's really, really awesome, really, really cool, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here at Kansas. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Kevin Harvick's 2022 Bush Life for the Farmers scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. Every time it seems like we come to, whether it's Atlanta or Kansas, Kevin Harvick tends to run a for the Farmers scheme. And honestly, I think this paint scheme looks really, really good in my opinion. I like the green on the car. I also like the color contrast on it. I think it looks really, really awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend here at Kansas. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Chris Buescher's 2022 Castrol DTX Full Synthetic Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. This, I believe, be the first time that Chris Buescher has been sponsored by Castrol this weekend. So it's cool to see the Castrols changing up how they're doing the paint scheme. Usually it's a green color on them this weekend. It's a white looking color, which I think looks really, really awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this weekend at Kansas. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is B.J. McLeod's 2022 General Formulation Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. General Formulation's already sponsored Corey LaJoy this season, so this is the second driver that they are sponsoring. Pretty cool that B.J. McLeod continues to pick up new sponsors, and I think the paint scheme actually looks pretty decent in my opinion. Looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this weekend at Kansas. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s 2022 Dillon's Louisiana Hot Sauce Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. Honestly, I'm not really the biggest fan of this paint scheme. There's some things I like about it, but I'm not overall the biggest fan of it. It's cool to see that they do have new partners that are willing to work with them. It's good to see Louisiana Hot Sauce is continuing to work with them. Just in my honest and sincere opinion, I'm not as big a fan of this paint scheme. And a final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Noah Gregson. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Noah Gregson's 2022 Chevrolet scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Kansas. Very, very similar Chevrolet scheme to other ones, but it's actually more of a black looking one, which I think is really, really sick. I do love that Collar Grayson's been changing up their Chevy paint schemes every single week, it seems like. So that's one thing I really, really like, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Kansas in the Cup Series. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Sam Mayer's 2022 Buzz the X scheme that we're going to see later this year at Michigan. Really awesome. Sam Mayer has a new sponsor that is willing to work them. I think that's one thing that's really, really awesome to see. Yes, it's a crypto sponsorship, so people are really, really skeptical when it comes to crypto sponsorships. But I think it's a good-looking paint scheme overall, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack later this year at Michigan. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Pocono Truck Race as it has a title sponsor and it's once again for the second year in a row, it's going to be called the CRC Brake Lean 150. I believe CRC Brake Lean sponsored last year's Truck Series race at Pocono, the only time we ran our Pocono for the Truck Series last year and once again we're going to be sponsoring in 2022. Really awesome to see as CRC Brakeley is continuing their partnerships and sponsorships with the track. Really awesome to see, and it's good to see that a sponsor is committed to continue work. I think it's really, really awesome, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the Door Bumper Clear Podcast. As the Door Bumper Clear Podcast was announced on Monday afternoon, that they are going to be joining Math TV starting tomorrow. I believe it's going to be in the evening, and it's going to be starting on Math TV tomorrow. For those who don't know, the Door Bumper Clear Podcast is a podcast of multiple spotters. TJ Majors, Freddie Kraft, and Brett Griffin have a podcast. They also have Casey Bo, who runs kind of runs the questionnaires when they do the spot on spot off segments, and they have other people that work in that as well. And they've had a lot of tests, guests like Tommy Baldwin Jr., who will get in talking about him in just a little bit. But I think it's really incredible that the Door Bumper Clear Podcast is going to be joining. Yes, their opinions are very, very skeptical. Sometimes their opinions are not the greatest, but 
Overall, when you have a podcast like that, it's the second most popular podcast outside of the Dale Jr. Download in the Dirty Mo Media. I think it's important to have that podcast joining MAV TV. So overall, congratulations to them on getting an opportunity to join it. I think it's really, really awesome. And congratulations to them on that. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Jeff Gluck's poll from Darlington S. The Jeff Gluck poll came out from Darlington, and actually, they got a really high rating for the Darlington. It got 86.2% of people that actually said yes to the Jeff Gluck poll, which is the fourth highest out of 10 races that he's done at Darlington, and it's the eighth race out of 13 races, including the Clash, that it's been over 80%. Honestly, I expect the number to be a little bit higher than it actually was. I thought the number was going to be a little bit higher than that. But, again, some people didn't really like some of the dirty air situation. I also think a lot of Joey Logano, a lot of William Byron fans, were probably pissed off as well. But if you really, if you were mad about that, you really shouldn't take away from the fact that I thought the race is really, really good. And, honestly, this year we've had such good racing so far. So, in my opinion, the ratings are pretty, not ratings, but the Jeff Gluck poll rating is good in my opinion. I like that rating. Overall, to be honest with you, and it's good to see that they continue to get high marks on their ratings. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, is we actually have one paint scheme that I forgot to take a look at, and it's Josh Blicky's 2022 Ukrainian American Coordinating Council scheme in support of Ukraine. Overall, I think the paint scheme looks really, really solid, in my opinion. It's got the blue and the and the yellow colors, the fifth symbol for Ukraine. It's really good paint scheme, in my honest opinion, and I'm glad to see that he's going to be running that paint scheme. Looks pretty good, in my opinion. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the tire test at Pocono. As currently as I'm filming this video right now, there is a tire test that's going on at Pocono Speedway. Chris Bell for Toyota, Eric Omer for Ford, and Daniel Suarez for Chevy are testing at Pocono. Originally, Kyle Busch was supposed to test at Pocono, but because his baby came in yesterday, Lennox was his daughter, his baby girl's second kid. Right now, he's not going to be testing, so Chris Bell is currently testing at Pocono, basically trying to see if they're going to need tire compound out there on the racetrack or not. It's good to see if they're doing more tire tests. They're supposed to be doing more tire tests throughout the year. Uh, it's unclear at the moment when they will have that tire test or Marzo, considering there's supposed to be a tire test there. But there's a next-gen test going on for tires and seeing how the tires are going to work. I think that's really good to see. I'm glad to see if they're continuing to have tire tests to make sure the tires are up to temp. I think that's a good thing overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Worldwide Technology Music Festival. Along with the NASCAR Cup Series having their first ever cups going there to get Worldwide Technology Raceway for the first time, in correspondent, Worldwide Technology Raceway is having a major, major festival with among 30 acts that are going to be there. This includes Cole Swindell, Jimmy Allen, Nelly, Cameron Marlowe, Alexandria K. DJ Silver, among other local bands, are going to be part of this festival. On top of that, they are expecting around 83,000 people to be showing up to the inaugural Cup Series race at Worldwide Technology Raceway. I think it's absolutely huge that they're doing this festival, and that's one thing we've been asking for these tracks to do, is basically have kind of events that coordinate around the track. And it's going to bring a lot of people out there as well, and maybe they'll say, hey, I really enjoyed this. I might want to go out to the Cup Series race or I might go check out the racing, which I think is a great thing, by the way, that they're looking at that. I think the fact that they're having this activation is so important for the sport going forward, the fact that they're continuing to look at activation around the racetrack. I mean, they're talking about bringing kind of the Home Depot setup out of Gateway with John Roberts, Kenny Wallace. That's going to be out there. They've got some other cool things. There are going to be additions that are going to be coming out to the track as well. I think it's cool to see World Technology Raceway is continuing to have all these festivals, among other things, and they're setting up for potentially one of the biggest cup races of the season. By the way, I'm going to be there in three weeks, so y'all, if you see me at the track, say hello, but I think having this festival is, is really, really awesome, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Dale Jr. As Dale Jr. was saying on his Ask Dale Jr. Dallin, and he says that there currently is a rumor that there is going to be sealer that is going to be put down on North Wilkesboro to keep the track sealed up. Now, this year for the first time in nearly a decade, or basically 12 years, the last time they raced at North Wilkesboro was 2011. For the first time, starting this August, I think it's August, they're going to be having racing with the smart late models. Then eventually they're going to tear up the track, the asphalt, and turn it into a dirt track. And then eventually they're going to repave it in 2023 and what they're doing is they're probably going to be putting the sealer down to keep the track sealed up and the cracks and such which should be able to i believe also create grip i'm not entirely sure on that but i think having a sealer at north brooks would keep the track sealed because you have to remember and understand that north brooks 
That statement is so old that it's going to be so bumpy that I think that the sealer that they're going to put down there should be able to help to keep the track less bumpy. I'm not sure if that will help, but I think it's cool to see that they are going to be putting sealer down. I think it's kind of important to have that down on the track. And overall, it's great to see that they're going to be going ahead and putting sealer down the track. I think it's important that they do that for the racetrack to keep the track of the speed. I'm definitely really, by the way, I'm super pumped up and excited that North Wilkesboro is coming back. I might go out to one of those races later this year. I'm not entirely sure. But I'm absolutely excited that they are bringing North Folks are back on their racing schedule overall. And glad to see that they're putting Sealer down the track. It's a rumor currently, so it's not entirely confirmed. But say to Speedway Comedy, who's been kind of helping out with the track as well. So I think it's good to see overall they're looking to bring that the track back and put Sealer down on the track. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Tyler Hill. As Tyler Hill is going to be driving a 5 for Hill Motorsports this weekend at Kansas. This will be, I believe, a second attempt of the five truck is attempted to make a race this year. The first race they attempted to make was back at Circuit Americas, but unfortunately, they failed to qualify. Tyler Hill, of course, who is the younger, I believe the younger brother or the older brother of Timmy Hill, has raced in the Nassar Camp Road Truck Series and has had some decent success with Hill Motorsports in the past. And it's great to see that they're going to be entering two trucks this weekend, which, <clears throat> again, I think is a great thing that they're entering two trucks this weekend to try to help out the brothers and good to see the brothers are going to be racing against each other. Since no one's going to be going home to qualify, they actually will be able to make the race. So overall, they got to try to get that five truck as many owner's points as possible and try to get a good enough position. I think a top 25 run in the truck series will be really, really good. And I'm glad to see that he's going to be running this weekend at the track. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Trey Hutchins. As Trey Hutchins is going to be driving a 14 for his family's organization, Hutchin Racing Enterprise, this weekend at Kansas. I believe this will be Trey Hutchins' first attempt in 2022. He has not attempted a race so far up to this point. So like I mentioned, this should be, I believe, his first attempt of the 2022 season. Trey Hutchins is only 23 years old, so he's a very, very young driver, but he's been racing in truck series generally since around 2017 to 2018, but he's only ran on a limited basis. And we all know what he's most notable for is his unfortunate crash in 2021 at Charlotte when NASCAR didn't throw the caution. His truck was near the top of the wall, and unfortunately he got ran into by Johnny Sonner. I also think Drew Dollar got involved in that wreck as well last season. Overall, I think the goal for Drew Hutch, Trey Hutchins is to just be out there, collect as many laps as possible, and try to get as many owner's points just in case if he does want to run more races this season. I'm glad to see that Trey Hutchins is coming back to race. I think the more trucks in this series he has, the better. And I'm glad to see he's showing up this weekend at Kansas. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Jesse Awuji. As Jesse Awuji is going to be driving to 43 for Ray and Brothers Racing this weekend at Kansas. If you know my opinion on Jesse Awuji, when it comes to his racing, I think Jesse Awuji is a really nice guy. His racing craft, not so much. If you've seen Jesse Wuji race over the years, I don't think Jesse Wuji is the greatest driver. Jesse Wuji has been multiple laps down in races throughout the years. And on top of that, he was involved in that incident at Las Vegas where he caused a multiple car incident. Ryan Vargas got destroyed and multiple people got destroyed. And I can tell you the social media backlash that he got was pretty justified in my opinion considering he was kind of a wreckaholic. I really wish they had someone else in here. Like, I think Thad Moffitt would not be a better option. But get someone else in here that has a little bit of experience. Get someone like a Parker Clergerman. Parker Clergerman isn't racing. Why not put him in there? Or put Kyle Weather in this truck. I think they'd be better than Jesse Wooji. I understand why they're putting Jesse in there. He's got sponsorship funding from the Navy. He works in the, he's in the Navy. But at the same token, at the same time, I would rather have someone else in here, to be honest with you, than Jesse Wooji. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about Riley Herbst. As Riley Herbst is going to be driving a 17 for DHR Racing this weekend at Kansas. I believe this will be Riley Herbst's second attempt in the NASCAR Truck Series. His first race, I believe, came in the Daytona Truck Series opener. Where I believe he finished, and I think he finished race or crash. And I don't entirely remember. But I'll talk about Riley Herbst for a minute. This guy has actually really improved in the Xfinity Series this year. So, I mean, and getting some experience in the truck series is really not a bad thing. And we've seen a 17 truck be really capable of contending for some top fives and top tens. And I think with his Xfinity Series experience, because when he does drop down the truck series, he actually does quite well. I think generally Riley Hurts will be a contender for the win. I know it's kind of high expectations of Riley Hurts when he isn't the greatest driver in the world. But I think he's been generally one of the most improved NASCAR Xfinity Series drivers. And like I said, I think he's going to attempt for a top five or a top ten this weekend. I be, Like I said, I think he's got a potential outside shot of winning, but I think it's going to be tough to do that. 
But I'm really excited to see that Riley Herbs is coming into the truck series and running. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Riley Herbs. You all know my thoughts on this guy. But I have to give credit when credit's due. And when you're improving as much as he has, I don't blame him for getting an opportunity to race in this series. So I'm very happy to see he's getting an opportunity to race. And I'm glad to see he'll be racing in the truck series. I think it'd be good if he got a top 15, a top 10 this weekend. I think, think that'd be great for the truck series, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Team Penske. Now, there was a post that went out recently last night, about seven or eight hours ago, that Team Penske was actually testing a VA supercar. They had the Dick Johnson race, DGR, Team Penske organization, Dick Johnson racing organization, and they had a VA supercar, and they were spotted testing a supercar walk as gun Team Penske was with Ryan Blaney and Joey Logano. Austin Hendrick was not there because Austin Hendrick really does not need any road course experience, but Ryan Blaney and Joey Logano, who have points, have struggled on road courses and struggled last year at Watkins Glen, are trying to get experience for the Watkins Glen race. Now, I think that this is a very important, a great strategy they've done. And people are going to say, well, is this illegal? Well, actually, no. You can actually, I think, testing is banned if you use a current cup car, but the Hendrick Motorsports, they have the track attack program, and also, we've seen RCR bring guys like Austin Dillon and Ty Riddick out to test at Circuit of the Americas when they've competed in those races in the winter. So really, no, it's not a bad thing that they're doing this testing. And what this is going to do is it's going to get those guys experience. Now, Joey Logano does have a win here at Watkins Glen in 2015. But Ryan Blaney and him both really struggled last year with the Verizon, Verizon car last year, which that is going to be his scheme, by the way, this weekend. I think it is very awesome to see that they are testing this car again. I think it's a good move on their part. I don't think it's elite. I don't think it should be legal. I think the fact they're not letting any more testing happen is a little ridiculous. I think it helped, but I also think at the same time, NASCAR is trying to save money. So I can't entirely blame them on that part. But at the same token and same time, I think it's cool to see a Team Penske is testing a VA supercar. And maybe, just maybe, maybe in some way they're kind of helping out collaborate for what the car could look like when they go to Le Mans 24 hours. Maybe NASCAR is getting Roger Penske seen kind of help out with that program and bring more teams to help with that as well. But I really think what it is in, in all seriousness and honesty, I think it's testing so they get a little more experience when they go to Watkins Gun later this year so they can try to be against guys like Kyle Larson and Ross Chastain and Chase Elliott and Mark Trick Jr. and those guys so they can be very, very competitive against those guys and get some more road course experience considering road courses are going to be more common on the schedule going forward. We've been seeing a lot more. We've got six of them this year. We're talking of a Chicago Street course coming. So I think it's a cool to see a Team Penske is testing the net, basically a V8 suit car there. Pretty cool in my opinion, and I'm glad to see they're able to test that out. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Tommy Baldwin Jr. Now, Tommy Baldwin Jr. was on the Dale Jr., not Dale Jr., that one, the uh, Door Bumper Clear podcast this past week, and he was basically said that he was actually supposed to be Jeff Gorton's crew chief after Ray Abraham left, but due to this family, his dad not being very happy about it, and his son crying because he was friends with Jeff Burton and, and the Burton and Harrison, he told Ray Abraham to tear the contract up for him to go over and to basically crew chief for Jeff Gordon. Could you have imagined if Tommy Baldwin Jr. would have been the crew chief for Jeff Gordon? Tommy Baldwin Jr. is an amazing crew chief. You look over the years at Tommy Baldwin Jr. He won the Daytona 500 in 2002 with Ward Burton. He also won the Southern 500 in 2000 with Ward Burton. And imagine if Tommy Baldwin, who basically I think is one of the most underrated crew chiefs of all time. He's won a lot of races with multiple drivers over the years. He's been in the industry for many, many years. Could you imagine if Tommy Baldwin Jr., instead of staying with Ward Burton and crew chief for him in 2001, could you have imagined if Tommy Baldwin Jr. would have crew chief for Jeff Gordon? How much success we have. Now, like I said, he's decided to stay there and actually worked out for him and eventually went to go on his own organization starting in 2009. But, you, but Jeff Gordon then eventually went for Robbie Loomis. But I think that if Tommy Baldwin Jr. would have been crew chief, do I think that Jeff Gordon has the same success as he has? Absolutely. When Ray Abraham recommends you to go to an organization, you kind of listen to Ray Abraham because Ray Abraham kind of knows what he's talking about. And Ray Abraham really brought a lot of success to Jeff Gordon. It's just such an interesting story to me that basically Tommy Baldwin Jr. had an opportunity. When I saw that, my eyes completely popped open. I was like, what? Are you serious? He basically has an opportunity to go to work with, at the time, Jeff Gordon, who's arguably the great, it could be argued that he could potentially could be the greatest driver of all time, most talented driver of all time, I should say. 
Having been potentially working with Jeff Gordon would have been amazing. I don't know if Jeff Gordon really has a fall if he has if Ty Bowen works him, but I think it would have been cool to see him have an opportunity. But it didn't work and go there, and it really worked out with him in the end, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Andretti and F1. Now, we've talked about Andretti, and Andretti's been trying to get an F1 team called Andretti Global. They have everything ready to go, but very recently, at this past weekend at the Miami GP, which we're going to talk about the TV ratings around that here really, really soon. But Andretti basically, Gray Moffey basically said that we really don't need an 11th F1 team. Now, very recently, it was reported by Adam Stern, I believe on Monday evening, that basically he reports that I hear the Andretti F1 matter could soon be headed to the courts unless a solution is found. The last thing listed company Liberty Media can afford is a legal stand-up with the USA's first family of motor racing. Here's a very, very easy solution. I would read a really, really easy solution that shouldn't take two brain cells to come up with. Let them in Formula 1. If you don't want this to go to the courts, bring, bring them on. I know that you have your big teams that don't want you because you guys don't want the big payouts, but you have one of the biggest games in the racing world, Mario Andretti. Mario Andretti is arguably probably the greatest motorsports driver in the history of motorsports who's won everything. And you're telling me you guys cannot allow them in there because you don't want an 11th team? Why? Absolutely why? You have a team that's got everything ready to go at this point. You've got everything that's set up. The easiest thing you could do right now is allow Andretti into Formula 1. It's not freaking rocket science. It's not that freaking hard to get your organization in there. It's not that hard to do it. And this wouldn't be a situation at first because Michael Andretti was in the pack, basically seen if teams supported him. you got, of course, Total Wolf, who basically said, Andretti name doesn't matter. It's like, are you kidding me, Total Wolf? Are you freaking serious? You're such an elitist, dude. If you bring Andretti in, the most important thing is, in the U.S., the U.S. market has been absolutely grown. One of the biggest things that can help that U.S. market grow and really, really exponentially grow is bringing the Andretti name in. And look who potentially could be joining that team. I don't know, Colton Herta, who's been rumored for the last year or so that he wants to go to Formula One, who has been one of the most successful drivers in IndyCar the last few years. He has been admitting he wants to go to Formula One. Seriously, there's not rocket science here. If you want the sport to see long term and not fall off a rocket, NASCAR really has over the years, get this team in there. Not very hard to do. I hope that this doesn't go to the courts, because if it does go to the courts, that's going to be an issue. But honestly, in all seriousness, this should not be that hard to understand. It should not be that hard to comprehend. This should not be an issue, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Burger King. Now, very, very recently, Burger King, Burger King basically tweeted out that maybe tweeting and basically said vroom, something around Vroom Vroom in three days you're going to find out. I'm like, okay, is Burger King considering maybe coming back to the world of racing or NASCAR? Now, Burger King has not been in NASCAR in nearly over a decade. I believe the last time, well, they were in NASCAR, but not as a sponsor. Now, they, of course, had BK Racing that was around, I think, to 2017. But then we found out that it was basically a franchise owner, and Burger King was not really around that company. It was basically a franchise owner, and we found out that we found out what was going on with that company, basically that motorsport organization. But um, Burger King coming back, are they coming back as an organization, perhaps, as their own organization? Are they coming back to sponsor multiple drivers? Maybe sponsor got like, maybe they're sponsoring Kyle Busch. I mean, Kyle Busch is talking about maybe trying to get back a sponsor. Maybe they're sponsoring Kyle Busch. Maybe they're going to finally announce Kyle Busch's contract on Friday. Maybe that's what it's going to be. But the fact that Burger King kind of teased that is really intriguing. Or maybe they're going out and doing other bonus words. Maybe they're going to IndyCar. Maybe they're going over to work with Formula One, especially with the growth of Formula One. Maybe they're working with that. I really don't entirely know what exactly is going on here, but the fact that they typed that vroom vroom tells me something big is coming. And I think it's cool, really awesome and great to see that they are looking to potentially join a motorsports once again. I really hope it's true they're looking at it, or maybe they're just playing with us and they're trying to troll us. And sometimes you have these companies that really do troll us, but I don't know if entirely it's entirely a troll or not. I think it would be absolutely great to see Burger King come back to the world of racing. I think it'd be amazing. I think a lot of fans do miss Burger King. And I think having a company like Burger King, one of the biggest burger franchises, one of the biggest fast food franchises in the world, have it come into the world of racing once again, I think would be absolutely amazing. And honestly, I kind of hope it does happen where it does come back to the world of racing. I think it'd be amazing for the world and hopefully maybe in the near future 
we do see Burger King make its glorious return to the world of racing here in the future. I think it'd be really awesome, to be honest with you. Now we're going to jump on to the first of two major stories of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Chase Elliott. As like last year, Chase Elliott is going to be competing in the s track season finale at Sharon Speedway on July 23rd. Chase Elliott, like I said, competed last year at the National Fairgrounds. It was him versus his father for the overall victory there. He was able to go out there and win that event in his only start. He'll be looking to go two for two this weekend. Now, I think it's really cool to see that Chase Elliott is going out and racing in the s tracks for many, many reasons. One, Chase Elliott is the most popular NASCAR Cup Series driver. And having a driver like Chase Elliott, who is as popular as it is, having going out and racing the SRX, I think is a great thing overall. And of course, he'll be competing against a lot of good drivers this year. He's got more competition, including Ryan Blaney and Dale Blaney. Dave, not Dale Blaney. Ryan Blaney and Dave Blaney, who are both really good dirt racers. And it's going to be a dirt race, so this will chase Chase's dirt experience as well. It's not like a pavement race, so he may have a little bit less of an advantage this time around than he's had in the past. Because again, he is racing on a dirt track, and he isn't as good on dirt. But Ryan Blaney's also not the greatest on dirt, so I think Dave Blaney's going to be a threat. You also got Tony Stewart, who's probably going to be a threat to win that race as well. You've got other drivers in the series. Ryan Newman is one that I think will be a threat at that race as well. You've got other drivers like Michael Waltrip. You've got Paul Tracy back this year, Ryan hunter Ray. You've got other drivers that have joined the series as well. And honestly, I'm really excited, though, that they're going to have Chase Elliott and Ryan Blaney, two but really good friends, racing against each other. And again, having, you know, great guys like from other series like NASCAR come over and the younger crowd as well. Because again, when you do this well, you bring that younger crowd in. Because the Asterix does have a much older fan base that does watch. But the Asterix in Season 1 was really, really successful. I'm also very intrigued, though, to see what other NASCAR Cup Series drivers are they looking at to potentially bring in this series. Are they looking at maybe Kyle Busch to bring in this series? Kyle Busch being one of the most successful Cup Series drivers of all time. Is Kevin Harvick up for consideration? Is Dale Jr. up for consideration? Is Kyle Larson up for consideration? I think it'd be amazing if they had Kyle Larson come in and here a race. Probably one of the most successful American drivers currently out there at the moment. You would think that they'd be considering Kyle Larson as a potential opportunity to look at. I'm not entirely sure. But back Chase Elliott. How likely do I see Chase Elliott winning this race? I'm going to say very, very likely that I see him winning. But I don't think it's going to be a 100% knockout of the park like last year. Because like I said, you got Dave Blaney who's really good at dirt racing. He still knows how to get it done. I think it's going to come down to Chase Elliott versus Dave Blaney for the overall victory. Bill Elliott's going to be in the series for a couple races, but he's not going to be for the full season. So I don't think Bill and Chase are competing against each other. Chase is going to have to beat the Blaney this weekend. It's from their home track of Sharon Speedway. It's very intriguing that they're putting Sharon Speedway as season finale, but I love that they're going to different tracks this year. And I'm very excited to see that Chase Elliott is going to be getting in the Asterix once again. I hope we get more drivers like a Kyle Larson. I hope we get more entries every week as well. I'm absolutely excited to see that that has happening, and we'll see a Chase Elliott compete in the SRX here in the season finale race. And now we're going to jump on to the final major story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the TV race from Darlington in the Miami GP. For those of you who don't know, this weekend, both the NASCAR Cup Series race at Darlington and the Miami GP happened at the same time this weekend. And they were expected to be very, very close this weekend, and they were expected to be intrigued to see what the ratings were going to be for this weekend. So, for the NASCAR, we'll start off with the TV ratings for the NASCAR Cup Series at Darlington, which were on FS1. So, the Cup Series race got a 1.45 rating, 2.614 million viewers for that event. For the Miami GP, which is on ABC, it got a 1.08 TV rating and 2.066 million viewers for the whole event. However, for the whole event altogether, when it comes to the actual number of viewership for the race itself, the race actually got 2.58 million viewers. So the number was very, very close this year, and it was the most televised watch event in Formula One history, and the Cup Series race was down a little bit this week. But also another major area were Formula One being NASCAR. The 18 to 49 demographic, which all the advertisers and the TV viewers and the TV memberships and stuff are looking at. For the NASCAR Cup Series, the 18 to 49 demographic was 517,000. And for Formula One, it was 735,000. Now, a couple of things to be very interested to know is that 
for the Cubs Series Series, it was on FS1. So, of course, naturally, you're going to get less viewers on there. If this race on Fox, and honestly, this race should have been on Fox, one, it's one of your most marquee events. It's outside of Crown Jewel event. It's a throwback race for crying a lot. And second, especially with Formula One having the race on main network, I think it would be no rock. It would be rocket science to basically have it on your main network. I don't entirely understand why they did not put it on the main network right there. We could have had probably four to five million. Honestly, I think the 1849 demographic would have been a lot more closer than people realize. But it's also great to see that both Formula One and NASCAR are succeeding in both areas but going back to that demographic right there the 1849 demographic formula one is crushing nascar right now when it comes to the demographic and a lot of people ask why has formula one really grown in that demographic because nearly half the viewership is between that age of 18 to 49 and i can tell you exactly there's a lot of reason why formula one is really doing a good job number one drive to survive probably the biggest reason why formula one has grown as much you look at Drive to Survive and how successful that series is on Netflix. It's one of the most viral Netflix series out there, along with Tiger King and Fire Festival. It is one of the most popular Netflix series out there, and they just recently on Friday announced that they renewed for fifth and sixth season. That show has been very, very successful, and it's engaged a lot of audiences, and Brick goes behind and also is a great series. Another thing is that the app track experience. A lot of celebrities go out there. This weekend, you had Michael Jordan out there. Tom Brady was out there. Serena and Venus Williams were out there. Uh, Danica Patrick was out there. I think Wyclef Jean was out there. A ton of major names that were out there as well. So James Corden was out there as well, who got criticized for Danica Patrick. Another big thing is the TV broadcast. Compared to NASCAR, F1 has an incredible TV broadcast. They have Sky Sports. It's commentating. It's not ESPN. It is Sky Sports, but Sky Sports has done an incredible job with their commentary. They're always insightful. They always do a great job. They focus on what exactly is going on with that. They do a great job of TV. I think Formula One has the best TV coverage of any sport out there when it comes to the world of motorsports. I think it does have, generally, the best TV coverage. Another big thing is their social media game. Their social media presence is absolutely incredible. You've got Formula One drivers who are streaming on Twitch will bring a lot of younger audiences as well. Master Stappen, I believe, streams on Twitch. Pierre Gasly streams on Twitch. Lando Norris streams on Twitch. In fact, Lando Norris has his own group called Quadrant, who basically is uh, multiple individuals who are from different groups they bring on from there. Another big thing is they have a really good video game. Right now, F1 has a really good video game. They have a code with a license with EA and Codemasters, which is also bought by EA, by the way. And also a lot of other things, drivers are willing to go out of their comfort zones and they're willing to go out there and do a lot of different things. Look at they've done things with Vanity Fair. They've done a lot of magazines. They've gone to fashion and stuff. They've gone out and a lot of done things and drivers are willing to go out of their comfort zones. NASCAR is lacking in a lot of areas when it comes to this. Number one, TV coverage. I want to start off with that. TV coverage for NASCAR has generally been horrendous. They're not taking it seriously. I will say for a couple weeks there at Talladega and honestly at someone at uh, the Bristol Derby, I thought TV coverage was actually pretty soft. And they had at-track experience. They had a Home Depot setup, which is, was not exactly Home Depot setup, but they had that back in the track. And the pre-race shows were so good, unfortunately, for the last couple weeks. They were back at, uh, they were basically back and not at the ratio, back at the studio, which I think was such a horrible decision. But also, generally, the commentary has not been great as well. And another big thing is that Formula One doesn't have commercials. NASCAR has commercials every single race in full screen commercials. And I've been complaining about this that full screen commercials are freaking stupid. I don't know why we still have them in NASCAR. They need to go away side by side, do what IndyCar does during the race. They even sometimes during the cautions, they have side by side commercials. But they also have full screen commercials from time to time as well. IndyCar, but it's less frequent than NASCAR. Also, another thing is a video game series. Right now, there's not even a video game that's coming out for NASCAR this year because the company is very skeptical. Motorsports Games, a very skeptical company. We know a lot about what's going on with that company. I also sense some stuff around that. And geez, the things I've seen were not great about the company. A horrendous video game series where we haven't had a lot of good video games in a very, very long time. A great video game can bring younger kids and younger fans into the sport. That's one thing that could really help. Another thing is that the at-track experience. The Miami GP had 5G around the track all weekend. NASCAR races struggle with internet reception. Now, generally, you should not be on your phone unless you're a media member. That's one thing. If you're a media member, you obviously have the right to be on your phone right there. But if you're at the racetrack, unless you're filming like a good moment from the race, you don't need to be on your cell phone all the time. Kind of enjoyed experience. 
But I think if you're going to be at the track from time to time, you want to take some photos and stuff, you got to have good reception at the track. And reception at these tracks has been bad. I know that NASCAR has been trying to work on getting some stuff out there, but that's one thing they got to do. And getting back to it, drivers need to be, like I said, willing in NASCAR to be able to go out of their comfort zones. If they're willing to do that, I think NASCAR could do a lot better. Just right off, Formula 1 is doing a lot of things that NASCAR isn't doing right now that they absolutely should be doing to get the sport growing long term. They got to find a way to attract that younger audience. Yes, you got to focus on your core fan base, but your core fan base is aging very, very rapidly right now and it's aging. And we need to find a way to get that younger fan base. We're, our average fan base age, I think, is 56 or 57 years old right now. So we do have to find a way to get that younger core audience. So I hope it does happen for NASCAR. I hope it makes a lot of sense. I hope that NASCAR does find a way to attract that younger core audience going forward. So anyway, that's the today's Law NASCAR and Motorsports video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, notification on to be notified when a video does go live on my channel. Follow my true Facebook and Instagram, and for me on pages on list schedule below over that, and comment your thoughts on today's video. Do you, what are your thoughts on the F1 and NASCAR TV ratings, and do you think both sports succeeded this weekend? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Chase Lane competing at Sharon Speedway in the Asterix, and do you think he'll be competitive in that? Let me know in the comments below. Tomorrow on my channel, I'm going to have a, a video, a special video that's going to be dropping on the channel that I think you guys are going to like. And then Friday, depending how much news we have, I should have a news video dropping then. So anyway... Like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. I'll see you guys next time with some awesome NASCAR and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.